Well, today I am honored to be joined by Dr. Mary Haig, the global CISO of BAE Systems. Mary, thank you so much for being with us today. No, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, just to broadly start off, because I think it's incredibly interesting to our listeners, and I know I did a little bit of research about you. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey into cybersecurity and being a CISO? Because I think like many, it is not what we typically expect. Yes, if there is a typical journey, yeah. Um, so I started life as a semiconductor physicist, working on military thermal cameras, of all things, um, and then went into um, spinning out intellectual property out into businesses. So that gave me the kind of business experience of what's the market, who are the competition, how do you set up a successful business model, how are you going to get investment and, and grow it. And from that, I dived into cybersecurity because they asked me to go and work with a cybersecurity business on how they should develop their product. So that took me into the cyber world about uh, 15 years ago. And I've never left because it was such an interesting space to be in, in terms of, um, well, fascinating market, fascinating development, a real sense of purpose and doing good. Um, and so I, I kind of stayed in cyber and, and in there I've, I've done everything from uh, managing um, sort of business groups that were focused on cross domain solutions. So how do you connect the internet to top secret? Um, and the controls you have in place um, and security monitoring is quite a lot on the technologies and security monitoring so really broadening out and learning about lots of different uh, aspects of cyber security um, and there are so many different aspects of cyber security so sort of learning about more and more of those and managing those as product lines and services and then about three and a half years ago i got a phone call to say um are you interested in, in doing a CISO role at, at BA Systems, which which was one of those wonderful phone calls where you go immediately, oh, yes, because that's the, for me, that was the other side of the fence. So I'd been doing all of this work on developing products to take to market and understanding all of the customer problems and the market needs. And now suddenly I had the chance to go on to that, if you like, that customer side. So do cybersecurity for yourself across a company like BA Systems. And that was pretty exciting. Yeah. Can you help describe, because as I understand it, your role in BAE Systems is internal focused on the company's own security, but obviously BAE Systems also does cybersecurity work for its customers and clients. Mm -hmm. So what's that dynamic like in an organization that both delivers security and security services and products, but also has to be mindful of its own security controls and programs? Yeah. I mean, it's actually quite useful dynamic because, uh, there's a good understanding across all levels of the organization that that cyber security matters um you know you can easily see when you're producing um a product or a service to take into um a battle space environment you know a defense environment that stakes are high and cyber is a domain of warfare so our products in and of themselves must be resilient against that environment and of course, that plays back right back through to when you're building them in the environment within BA systems. So it's not some separate thing, the cybersecurity products to the cybersecurity of our internal infrastructure. The two uh, are inextricably linked. If you develop our products in a really poor security environment, they're not going to perform well in a, you know, the, the secrets will already have been leaked, if you like, um, of how they work. So um, although the from a strict, if you like, governance model point of view, engineering does the, um, the the management of that product side. From a what is good cybersecurity, what culture do we want across the whole organisation? How do you do good? Um, thinking about risk, thinking about threat, thinking about the controls you put in place. We try to do that uh, consistently across the organisation. So I work very closely with engineering and with manufacturing to drive that consistency wherever we can and in fact we updated our concept of operations recently our operating model so that it's one operating model describing it the whole of cybersecurity right across it ot products and internal infrastructure because they're so linked yeah 
No, that's fast. It's fascinating. And I think it's such a unique feature of so many companies like BAE that are doing kind of that customer facing work, but worrying about their own. I want to flip on you because um, I know that, you know, in, in your role as a leader in your background, I know you have been a big advocate for diversity in the field and women in particular. And I want to start with a quote that you gave earlier this summer. And you said, I hire for attitude and often it's the technical skills that we can't teach. Is there a moment in time, like what was the aha moment where you came to that philosophy? Mm, it was actually in this role. And so many people were saying to me, oh, one of our biggest risks is skill shortages. It's a really small pool of talent. Um, it's really hard to hire. And I, I listened to all of that and thought, okay, well, we'll grow our own. We'll, we've got to play a part as good cyber citizens in growing that talent pool. Because if a massive company like BAE can't do it, then who can, right? So, so we've got to yeah. be part of building that pool of people. And, and I looked at my team and who was in it and, and thought they're not all, they've not all got cybersecurity degrees. They're not all computer scientists. They're from a massive range of background. I'm a physicist, we've got a biologist, a geographer, a, a dancer. Um, it's so many different backgrounds and yet they were all really strong together. And, um, and actually they were strong partly because of that diversity of background. Um, and so then when I was, I was actually having some, some mentoring with a coach and, and really getting into, uh, kind of how do I build teams and how I do I think about the behaviors that I want. And I, I realized that when I drew that kind of hierarchy of needs, when you're thinking about building a team, it, it wasn't technical skill that was at the top. It was those attitudes, that moral code, because if the team really gels together in a common moral code, we've got each other's backs. We absolutely trust each other. We've got the same kind of outlook on those fundamental things then you have an incredibly strong foundation to your team and you can build the rest of it after that. So it was, it, it was something that I think I've done for a little bit, perhaps, but perhaps not as consciously. And, and then when it became a really conscious thing, it allows you to build it out a little bit more, doesn't it? Right. Well, and, and, and I love it and I'm very biased in saying I love this because um, Rick Howard and I um, have given many a talk and we have this kind of metaphor that we use that building a cybersecurity team is similar to um, the book Moneyball by um, Michael Lewis here in the in the US around it is a team-based approach, and we often don't take a team-based approach to building out our cybersecurity teams. And, you know, so it's like, how do you kind of look at the entire playing field and identify the positions and where people go? And just because you bring on that superstar, like having it, even, even if you have a team, right? We see this, it's the Olympics, like you have a team of all superstars, that doesn't mean that they all are gonna work well together as a team. So being able to understand that dynamic um, just as much as the raw skill sets is so important. So I love that. And, it, and if you take your sporting metaphor a step further, the team of superstars are the visible ones but behind the team of superstars are the dietitians and the trainers and the psychologists. And, you know, actually there's a massive uh, range of people that have led to those visible ones being the superstars. And it's the same in the cyber teams that, you know, people like the cybersecurity architects or the head of the SOC or Pentas, they're very visible, um, but actually it's a whole massive load more that happens behind the scenes to deliver a good cybersecurity effect. Right. Um, you know, one thing I know that you also have talked about is the importance of data and how that drives so much of the decision making and prioritization that happens within your team at BAE. And obviously we're talking a lot about people, but I would love to understand more. What are some of the things that you and your team are doing? What does BAE do to sort of embody that data driven approach to making decisions when it comes to building teams, but also identifying what are your priorities in your security controls and program? Yep. Um, so there were kind of two key bits when I came in as, as CISO that felt really important because there was a lot of, I call it emotional 
based decisions that were then revisited and rechallenged lots of times. So it took a long time to reach a consensus and a decision. And that, in a world where, in cybersecurity, agility is unbelievably important because the threats changing and the technologies are changing. So if you take a long time to work out how to respond to that, you're behind the curve already. Um, so there was uh, the data underpinning understanding where your risk is and uh, and the governance model such that you can show that data to the right group of people at the right cadence at the right time such that they make right decisions you've got the right expertise in the room to make the decisions and they're then you know that decision then sticks those two things together were really important so we spent quite a bit of time looking at how do other people do it is the best practice out there around the, the dashboards and you can you can you can sketch up what you'd like to see to drive decisions um so we, we sort of did it from a point of view of i'm going to need to make these type of decisions so what data would make help me make do that as opposed to here's a load of data did that help you make the decision because sometimes you can be overwhelmed um the difficult bit then of course is the plumbing behind that so it's easy to sketch a dashboard but you need the data to be plumbed in and to be consistent across the organization such that it does hang together in a dashboard that gives you a good picture across the organization at scale so we did a lot of work on um and getting that plumbing in place which is you know never the most uh, attractive exciting thing but actually is absolutely fundamental to having those dashboards yeah. and, and well and but uh, to your point i mean it's so critical to know what business objective you're trying to accomplish at the get-go because yeah. it's so there's so much minutia and tedium to kind of yeah. get all that data going and it can also be very confusing because there's so much data that we have at our disposal so how do you really separate that signal from the noise of, yeah. kind of what we have it, it's what what's the question you're trying to answer yeah. start with the question and then and then go to the data but we were willing to build a few dashboards which we threw away so, so we did have some which we built and then went, yeah, no, that's not actually useful. So there is a bit of um, a kind of fail fast approach to it. Yeah. It is really important to start on the question rather than the data. Now, I know BAE is a global company and so has to, to sort of perform across regulatory schema in many countries. But in the US, um, the Office of the National Cyber Director and the White House has been making a big push around skills-based hiring, specifically in the government, in the US government, and even to the point of reclassifying job codes. And I'm curious where that, if you have seen, again, I know this is on the more of the customer client facing side than internally, but has that started to change the way BAE is thinking about its workforce, how it supports those US federal government clients, and what are they doing in order to, to sort of evolve to kind of meet those new requirements? Yeah. Um... I'd, we're seeing that push from across five so across the US, UK, okay. Australia, um, uh, in particular, and and I'd sort of characterise it as cybersecurity in the grand scheme of things is quite a new space, really, and we're trying to professionalise. So you know, you see my generation coming through with a whole load of of crazy and fantastic backgrounds. That's brilliant, but we do need to both professionalize it so you particularly for smaller companies I think it's you know it's quite hard if you're starting from scratch building a cybersecurity capability knowing what you're looking for because there isn't um uh that the, well there is increasingly qualifications which you can go yes if you've got that that and that then they're good but but it's a little bit mixed so professionalizing it more is is an important part of the maturing cybersecurity as a profession whilst not losing some of those useful backgrounds so we do need to make sure that the professionalization still brings career changes in yeah. um, because they're a valuable part of it so we've we're tracking that um uh uk cyber security council has has done some work on that in the us as you've called out um and we're trying to mirror that so simple things like our way of describing the roles of cyber security we have taken as it happens the the uk way of describing it because what i don't want is to hire for a, a job role and use a totally different term from it than anyone else in the market because it's really unhelpful 
um, so standardizing the way that we talk about roles and the development framework. So if you're in this role, these are the types of um, the way that you would develop your career in that role and taking that deliberately from government developed things um, because it's only when industry gets behind government that you get the momentum to standardize and to professionalize it. Right. And, you know, as, as someone who has spent a lot of my time in that space, it just is a, it takes a lot of strategy and thought that often I think as a security profession, we, we don't want to take that step back and do that lift because we're like, well, no, that you have to defend the network now. And that takes a lot of, of that kind of strategic step back work. So we often yeah. get stuck in this in between purgatory. Yeah. And, and I don't, I think it is something that's better to do at a, a national level, because if, if I did it in other the other Defence Prime did it, not only would it take up a lot of our time, but we'd all come out with something tiny bit different. Right. And, and actually those differences don't add value. So pull together a really good team at a national level and then everyone else takes it. That, that's right. sort of, I think, the most efficient approach. Um, my, my last question is I do want to touch on the diversity in the field. Um, one, because I always love to have a chance to talk to other really amazing industry executives and women in the field who have really made it to the top of their games. And, you know, one thing that always frustrates me when we talk about the cybersecurity profession and the people strategy associated with it is that, you know, I think everyone kind of lines up and says, we have this need for diversity and we're committed to doing these things. And I think there's a lot of consensus around that point. But I also think there are still some really major roadblocks that seem to be preventing us from making any real like fast or demonstrative progress. I mean, it's happening, but it's happening, I think, more slowly than many of us would like. What do you think is standing in the way of, of kind of us as leaders in addressing those diversity and, and gap and kind of talent issues we've kind of discussed? And what are some of the things maybe that we can look to, to implement in the future to be, you know, I don't want to end on a negative note. I want to be optimistic no. here that there's a way to, to, to kind of make that forward momentum and progress. Yeah. Well, obviously recognizes it, recognizing it is an important first step. And as you say, I think mostly people have done that. It's sometimes a tendency to go admire the problem and go, oh, it's so big that there's, you know, that, that, that oh, if I do this little thing, is it really going to make a difference? Um, there is no silver bullet. It's lots of little things. And the more we just get on and do those. So if I give some examples, um, when when we look at our talent management, we look at our high performers, I always ask the question on the diversity of those high performance, high performers. When we're promoting people to fellows, so the technical excellence, have we got the diversity in there? And in some cases we find we haven't, and it, all it needs is a tap on the shoulder. So in our fellows, for example, we had one female application. So we halted the process. I went out to a load of brilliant women and said, you know, there's this fellow thing and I think you'd be really good for it. And pretty much all of them went, I didn't think I was good enough. And all it took was a tap on the shoulder to say, you're so good enough. And then they applied. And now the diversity of our fellows is quite a lot better than it was. And, and as soon as you get that momentum in, it grows from there. Mentoring is another area that's really close to my heart. It's not that hard to set up a mentoring scheme. We set up a women in cyber mentoring scheme. We didn't want it to be just BAE because the value of mentoring is, is broad um, perspectives. So I use my industry contacts and we've got so many different companies involved from governments, um, Defence Research Labs in the UK, to Microsoft, to, to some of the big five consultancies, PwC. They're all involved in it because they can, you know, if you set up a good scheme, they'll all get involved. So we've got this cross industry mentoring scheme for women in cyber and the mentors can be men or women. And mentoring can be such an important moment in people's career. That moment when they just don't feel like they belong, they don't quite know where they're going. They've had a really bad day and they didn't feel like they were listened to in a meeting or they were interrupted so many times just having that that mentor that you can ring up um and go how do i handle this situation it's really you know someone really trusting that you can talk to can make the difference between someone saying do you know what i just haven't got the energy anymore versus i'm I, okay i know how to handle this i can i can um 
I can bring in some more tools. I can challenge what's happening and and stay in the industry. So never underestimate those small things that you do to really drive the change. Yeah, well, and one of the things that has struck me, um, and I, I apologize for using a stat that's very US centric, um, I'd have to relook it for where we are in kind of the global phenomenon. But, you know, as we track supply and demand in the US, uh, and it's all publicly available of like, what jobs are open and available, and then what's the availability of applicants, where is the talent pool? We've kind of for the first time seen that we have a surplus of entry level candidates for roles. There are more candidates available than roles, which is a great news story in that we have gotten, we're getting more people interested in entering the field. Yeah. But now to your point, we, we still have this major gap in the middle. And, you know, when you talk about mentorship and bringing someone along, like we're not going to be able to fill that gap in the middle or the gap of people who are starting to retire out or, you know, exit no. the field at their senior levels until we have some mechanism, not only to mentor, but bring them through. Yeah. And it really resonates with me when you talk about like, a lot of women, they won't apply if they don't feel they meet all the qualifications. But the reality is we're not going to be able to grow that talent unless we're part of the solution as industry to get them there. So it's, you know, it's twofold. It's like, how are we supporting those development pathways to bring people into those, Definitely. those positions? And, you know, that middle ground of people, those are the people that that's why retention matters so much that, that they do stay in and that you do have a way of really leaning in and, and, and coaching them and developing them. Uh, and I'll hook it back. That's why the behaviors piece in your team and the culture matters so much. Because if you've got that good moral code and culture in the team, do you know what? It's an inclusive environment. And it being an inclusive environment is massively important to the retention that, that everyone's voice is heard and respected. Um, that, that makes a huge difference to feeling like you belong, which is yeah. just essential.